Uh, thanks for this kind introduction, Jim. It's very good to be here. I will try to resist the temptation to talk about climate, and I would like to discuss something that's really important, namely the economy. The theme that I want to advance is that in order to improve the economy and gain prosperity, overcome poverty, and all these other good things, what we need is cheap and secure energy. Energy is the key, in my view, for a prosperous United States. And I want to talk about how we're going to go about this. I can't think of a better way to start than by quoting Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> she said, we've got to stop using fossil fuels and switch to natural gas. <laughs> but in a sense, she's right. And what has happened, of course, is the natural gas revolution, which has lowered the price of natural gas from about $13 in MCF. MCF is 1,000 cubic foot. So from $13 a few years ago to $2 recently, it may still go down further. It may go up. Very hard to tell. Depends on s supply and demand. And we don't know what the supply and demand situation will be. Anyway, natural gas has become competitive with coal on a BTU basis. That is, it, the same price per BTU for natural gas as for coal, which has traditionally been the cheapest fuel in the United States. And that is why over half of the electric power generated in the United States has come from coal. This has now dropped to 40%, and more utilities are switching to natural gas. Of course, they're also reacting to uh, insane regulations from the Environmental Protection Agency. But in a sense, the regulations from the EPA are going to be academic. The market will win out. If natural gas indeed is cheaper than coal, that will, be determ that will determine how electric power is produced. What I would like to point out to you is that natural gas has the capability not only of matching coal on a BTU basis, but it has the capability of generating energy, electricity, that is, more efficiently. Now, I should start by saying when I was a boy, well, uh, when I started in this business, the efficiency of power plants was of the order of 30%. When my father was a young man, it was of the order of 1%. That is, only 1% of the heat content of the fuel actually produced electricity. It's now about 35%. That's a good average number. In principle, we can go to 65%, maybe 80%. We can start to approach the magic goal of 100% efficiency. That is the goal we should be striving for, 100% efficiency. And I will try to describe to you how we intend to do this. We're serious about this. We're not kidding. So our goal is 100% efficiency of energy use. We aim for high efficiency, the highest possible efficiency, and the least amount of waste because every a bit of energy that's not used to generate electricity is wasted. It has to be disposed of, which is an expensive issue, a difficult issue sometimes. We also will talk about how natural gas compares to oil. Let me get that out of the way first. If you look at the cost or the price per BTU, price per BTU, for natural gas compared to oil, you find that oil is more expensive, or has been, by a factor of seven. Seven. 
seven to one. Oil was selling for $110 a barrel for crude, while gas was selling for $2. Now oil has gone down to uh, about $90, but still, six to one is still a very, very attractive ratio. What this means is, there's every reason to believe that natural gas will replace oil as a transportation fuel. It can do this directly as compressed natural gas or as liquefied natural gas, and is doing it already for trucks, for intercontinental trucks, which can afford to make the modification and which save them a lot of money. But the more direct way is to turn natural gas into gasoline or diesel directly. It's a chemical engineering job. It's not, a, it's not difficult. It's been done, it was done during World War II in Germany when they turned coal into gasoline or f to fuel their tanks. It was done in South Africa by Sasso when they turned coal into transportation fuels. Coal is much more difficult to deal with than natural gas. Much easier to turn natural gas directly into transportation fuels. And with the ratios the way they are, it's a very attractive proposition. Shell Oil is building the largest conversion plant in Qatar on the Arabian Peninsula to take advantage of cheap natural gas in Qatar. And th what this will do, of course, is it will lower the world price of oil. It will lower our imports if we do it here. It will be a revolution OPEC will go out of business. Not that I <laughs> feel sorry for them. They've had a nice ride. But it's something to contemplate. An additional nice point is that it will go into a transportation fuel directly. You don't need refineries. Refineries have to modify crude in order to get gasoline. You can make gasoline or diesel directly from natural gas and save a lot of money. But my passion is electricity. So I'll come back to that. And I would like to tell you what we are doing. When I say we, I really mean we. Me and a few associates. We have set up a new company a profit-making company, which will make electricity on a small scale in Crystal City, Virginia, which is a small part of Arlington, Virginia, happens to be the part where I live. And we will use combined cycle plant, which is commercially available from GE and any number of other suppliers, Japanese, German suppliers, but GE makes a good, good working model, widely used. That's a gas turbine followed by a steam turbine. So you burn the gas, run the turbines, and then you get hot gas out, still hot enough to make steam, and then finally you get hot water out. Now comes the trick. How do you make money on this? You sell the hot water. We have at Crystal City high-rise buildings, apartment buildings, office buildings, and hotels. They all make their own hot water. They all have boilers. They all spend a lot of money making hot water, not for heating, for hot water, for laundry, and other purposes. Every BTU of hot water we sell them, in principle, could be profitable. So it's a great opportunity. Furthermore, distributed power has other advantages. It is more secure. It's more secure against terrorism. It's more secure against uh, weather phenomena. We just had uh, blackouts in Virginia because of big storms. In the winter, we get blackouts when the snow weighs down uh, transmission lines and so on. 
uh, it, it's, a, it's a good deal in every way. And if we can use the last squeal of the pig, which is the warm water which finally comes out at the end, we can achieve almost 100% efficiency. And efficiency gains means money made. So we want to spread the idea, franchise it if we can, because there are many little wrinkles to this that we've discovered on how to do this properly and get the idea across to many communities in the United States and elsewhere and see if we can't use energy more efficiently. So again, our goal is energy efficiency, natural resource conservation, I hate to use that word, sustainability. <laughs> yes, I've uttered that magic word. That, I think, alone should sell it to a certain class of people. Now, I want to talk about the difficulties. We have an election coming up. We have Mr. Obama probably running against Mr. Romney. Obama has already told us certain things, and I want to quote them. In 2008, he told us he will make electricity prices skyrocket, and he's kept his promise. Man is as good as his word. And when he lost the battle in Congress to institute cap and trade, he said, you'll find other ways to skin the cat. And he's kept his promise. He's got the EPA working on outlawing coal, basically, making coal impossible as a fuel in the United States. But coal is no longer our cheapest fuel. So it doesn't really, may not really matter. And finally, he has said that in his next administration, if he's reelected, one of his main priorities will be climate change. There, I've added the magic word. I won't say any more about it. You all know how I feel. And if you don't, I hope you'll read Climate Change Reconsidered, published by the Heartland Institute, and look for the forthcoming edition in 2013, which I hope will be the capstone of our work of the, of the non-governmental international panel on climate change. I'll leave the pronunciation of this to you. <laughs> it's a long, it's a long story. Unfortunately, we don't know what Mr. Romney will do. He has not committed himself on this issue, but we'd like to see uh, influences. We'd like to see the Heartland Institute particularly broadcast this idea widely throughout the United States, and perhaps this will have some influence on the way the election will move and on the way the candidates will behave once elected in November. Thank you very much. Well, Jim, Jim has his hand up first. Ladies first. He did. Okay, uh, we have incorporated, we have a board, and we have the initial financing. It's all set. And we're now making the master plan, the detail plan, and of course, the inevitable negotiations. Now, our aim is to adjust the cash flow in such a way that we won't need any more financing. That may be a, a pious hope, but you know, uh, if you do the negotiations properly, and if you hedge wherever you can, and I'm a great believer in hedging, we might be able to adjust cash flow so we won't need to ra go out and start raising money. I hate to raise money. <laughs> it's a tough job. So we're well on our way. Our president, I think you already know him, is Kenneth Hapala, and our board is the SEPP board, plus one more, 
It's a very good board. It happens to be the best possible board for this purpose. One of our board members, uh, Donna F uh, Fitzpatrick Bethel, is a former deputy secretary of the Department of Energy. And she has a degree in physics and in law. Another one is Tom Sheehan, who has a PhD in physics from MIT, and most recently uh, held forth in, within DOE uh, on renewable energy. And he finally quit because he couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. I'm sure Jim Johnson has great questions, but so this unit that you're buying, <laughs> It's a small thing. Which it is easily contained. We have the real estate already in Crystal City. It's owned by the city of Arlington. It's a sewage treatment plant. It has extra space. And uh, I, I don't see why anybody would object, would object to putting something else up next to a sewage treatment plant. <laughs> and incidentally, if we have any warm water left over, we'll feed it to the sewage treatment plant to keep the bugs happy. You know, bugs uh, chew up the sewage like warm water. They work much harder, much better when the water is warm. Jim, you had a question. Yes. Um, it occurs to me that uh, your system, distributed system, would have the advantage of minimizing the impact on the grid. Unlike wind and solar, you would presumably not have to make big investments in the grid if you have the power production low, uh, close to where it's consumed. And that leads to another question. Are, are you having difficulty interacting with the incumbent utility? With the what? With the, the PEPCO, uh, the company that... Uh, in Arlington, no. The local government is all for this. They will make money on this because we will pay them a rent for space. Uh, we'll sell them back the electricity. That's, that is already established by law. They have to buy it. Am I right on the, the impact on the grid? Minimal? On the what? The grid, the distribution system. Oh, it'll be minimal, yeah. Uh, we're, 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 we're a small flea on a big elephant. <laughs> That's all, yeah. Uh, I suppose one more thing. Uh, it makes the environmental problems much simpler. One of the big environmental problems is to dispose of waste heat. One way to dispose of waste heat is to have no waste heat. That's our aim. In any case, it's always easy to dispose of it if you are distributed. You're more secure, you're safer. It's, it's, a, it's a lot better. I would like to mention a few things that could go wrong. Uh, we don't know which way prices will move. Natural gas is now very cheap. It is driven primarily by drillers who are drilling uh, not for natural gas, but for oil. Natural gas is sort of a byproduct, which they're very happy to sell at almost any price because they make their money on oil and natural gas liquids, of which there's now a glut in the United States. We have too much propane and butane, but this glut will disappear. Markets work magically. If there's a glut, the price adjusts, and suddenly, after a while, there's no glut. That's the beauty of it. Now, as the price of oil, the world price of oil, that's very hard to predict also. While the ratios now are extremely favorable for turning natural gas into transportation fuel, this may not always be the case. I can see the price of oil, world oil, uh, falling below $60 a barrel. Uh, it'll make uh, gasoline at the pump much cheaper. It'll be about between $2 and $2.50. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I, I won't uh, comment on it. But our present Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, is 
well known, and his quote is, that he would like to see gasoline prices rise to between $8 and $10, as in Europe. He thinks that's a good idea. Well, good luck to him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing he's not running, but of course, uh, we like to quote him whenever we can. Yes? There have been a number of articles recently about the, the energy revolution which is being brought about by various technologies. That Jim, you better come up here, because sometimes I have difficulty hearing, and, and well, sometimes I'll, I'll speak these up. questions right. are very long, and you, you can condense them. I'll, I'll do my best. Speak uh, between the two. I'll, I'll speak up and I'll, I'll make it concise. Uh, could, could you comment on the, the impact of uh, the various technologies such as fracking and so forth, which uh, some have said will make the U.S., uh, the Saudi Arabia uh, uh, of the world, <laughs> it will replace Saudi Arabia and make it a major energy exporter and so forth. Uh, can you comment? not just about fracking, but about uh, uh, energy technology in general, and your opinion about yeah. what uh, the impact of these technologies is likely to have on the U.S. as an energy producer over coming decades? Um, we already see signs of EPA trying to uh, regulate fracking under the guise that this could produce an environmental impact on drinking water, aquifers. It's far-fetched, and of course they will not succeed. Uh, particularly, they would not succeed if the election goes against uh, the present EPA. The new EPA will be, would be very different, one would hope. Of course, keep in mind that the same people will stay on, and it will take a very strong administrator a very strong administrator to control the EPA. You have no idea what the, this organization is like. I was a, in the EPA. I was a deputy assistant administrator. I couldn't take it many, for more than six months. Those people are fanatics. That's why they joined the EPA. How much fossil fuel do we have left in the United States? I mean, I've heard estimates of um, we can go another 250 years with the current fossil fuel technology. I've heard 150. I've heard almost 300. If we were to have no more advancements in, in you know, or some kind of new fuel, how long uh, could we go on as is? It's, I think I, I never indulge in these kinds of predictions. In fact, I don't make predictions generally because they always turn out to be wrong. Uh, we don't know enough about new technology developments. Uh, in 1971, I worked with Ralph Keeley and John Turk at the University of Texas. We tried to do what amounts to horizontal drilling to recover what is called heavy oil. We would uh, put steam into uh, horizontal holes. Now, how did we drill horizontal holes? Well, b that was before they had guided drilling. We, uh, Jan Turk, thought of this idea of making a big cavity in the earth, uh, sort of 30 feet wide, and then going down and actually drilling horizontally from there. An interesting idea, but of course not very practical. Never went anywhere. We failed. Well, we, well, we failed. We, we never actually got going. We couldn't attract the financing. Probably just as well. Uh, I, c I can't answer your question. We don't know what's going to happen to uh, gas hydrates, the next new resource, which uh, is huge, even huger than anything one can conceive of. And it's worldwide. And by that time, natural gas being turned into a liquid will become a world fuel. So it doesn't matter where it's produced. What are gas hydrates? What are they? What, what are gas hydrates? Oh, um, methane hydrates are um, generally found in ocean sediments. We have a great deal of that resource off the Atlantic coast. Uh, these are uh, ISIS 
that is water isis containing methane, or methane is locked into them. And we've not been able to figure out, or we, uh, the technologists have not been able to figure out a way of recovering the methane from these hydrates. Recently, by this I mean in the last two months, the Japanese, who also have that resource, have done experiments where they show that they can, in fact, drill into the hydrate and maybe derive some methane. I'm not familiar with the details. I hope it works. What it would mean is that gas would become even cheaper than it is today. And there's a lot of it? Oh, there's a... And it's locked in ice? Thousands of years. And it's, it's uh, locked up in ice, did you say? Yes, yes. Dr. Singer, update us on a uh, couple things regarding one of my favorite people, uh, Mr. Michael Mann. I understand that uh, the, the Attorney General in Virginia tried to get his emails from your university, University of Virginia, and the Supreme Court of Virginia refused that, but I understand there's also a, a second challenge. And what also can you tell us about uh, Mr. Mann's libel no. Suit up in the expert on this field, on this issue, is Chris Horner uh, of CEI. I wish he were here, but he's not, so I will try to tell you what I know. The effort was led by uh, the, our Attorney General, duly elected in 2009, uh, Kenneth Cuccinelli, who, by the way, is running for governor. <laughs> um, the university has resisted him, which is very strange. They won't release their email, these emails to him because he is their lawyer. It's a state university. So they've hired uh, independent outside lawyers and spent nearly a million dollars defending it. And the Supreme Court has upheld, the Virginia Supreme Court has upheld the university. However, uh, but and said that the demand that Cuccinelli made was not proper, uh, didn't meet certain criteria. It's a purely legal issue. Now, there's a second channel, and that is the American Tradition Institute. They filed a Freedom of Information Act case against the University of Virginia, and the university made the mistake of releasing these emails to Michael Mann. So they've already released them to one party. And they will have a difficult time resisting uh, the, this second lawsuit. The way it stands right now, they've had a hearing in Manassas, Virginia, which is not far from Washington. And uh, the case is proceeding. And as best I know, it will go forward. And I hope we will succeed. In the meantime, since these th things take a long time, Cuccinelli may well be elected governor. You can imagine what will happen then. <laughs> the university budget is determined by the governor of the, of the state of Virginia, since it's a state institution. And there are many claimants on this university budget. I mean, there are other uni state universities like William and Mary, uh, Virginia Tech, George Mason University, and so on. They all would like to get a larger piece of the pie. Now, it turns out that the Board of Visitors of the University of Virginia, sorry to be going on on this, has uh, tried to fire the president of the University of Virginia. Uh, they didn't explain their a reason. And she was fired. And then uh, they reconsidered because there was pressure on the Board of Regents. We don't know from where. And she's been reinstated. If she had any sense, she would leave. But uh, some people don't have much sense, so she probably will stay. But uh, if, that, if she stays, the chances are the University of Virginia will be in opposition to our forthcoming newly to be elected governor, which should be an interesting situation. That's, I'm speaking about my university now. Fortunately, I do not depend on them for any funds. Uh, my retirement money comes from TIA, CREF, and not from the university. Is it possible in 
one or a few minutes to explain the technology of, of um, converting gas, natural gas, to gasoline or other fuels? Yes. Well, the process is an old one. It's called the fischer tropsch reaction. You can look it up on Google. And the process is called the Lurgi process, L-U-R-G-I. And it was uh, developed commercially during World War II and used successfully in South Africa for some decades while South Africa was under uh, sanctions. It's a chemical engineering process. Uh, you basically create syngas, synthetic gas, which means carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and then somehow with the aid of catalysts and other magic things that chemists understand, you create uh, long chain hydrocarbons like uh, oil and diesel, or like gasoline and diesel. Do you think it'd be more efficient to use the natural gas directly for transportation? For a well, that's a good technology? question. Um, probably in some cases, yes. In most cases, no. I think it would be more efficient and cheaper for big trucks. They can carry the extra weight of compressed natural gas in cylinders, or they can even carry liquidified natural gas. And they don't have to stop every 100 miles or so to refill, so they don't need gas stations. But the ordinary car, the family car, that's a different proposition. We don't want to disturb our infrastructure, which is now set up for gasoline. So the simplest thing is to replace gasoline from crude oil, which means fra uh, cracking it into shorter molecules, uh, into gasoline from methane, which means building it up from real, really short molecules. Am I correct in my uh, uh, observation that, that, that most technologies, uh, the physical dimensions get smaller? Uh, nuclear power plants, uh, electricity? Yes. And they tend to get smaller physical computers. Uh, it is a historical fact, yes. And so that. Uh, I don't know. I imagine that there's an irreducible minimum. Yeah. We have the nanotechnology <laughs> now, so <laughs> yeah. we don't know how, how it can go. But, uh, but then it may be potential for this conversion technology to be lower to the point where you can have at least small gas stations uh, making their own gas yeah, on I, site. And it's a lot easier to transport the natural gas than it is the gasoline. Or in the case of, we, we run 250 trucks. If I could make the diesel or, or, or compressed uh, natural it's interesting. gas we, locally, we, it would be, uh, transportation-wise, yeah. a lot of energy saved in moving yeah. uh, this, since natural gas goes through pipes easily. Uh, our board actually discussed this idea, and we decided we don't, we don't want to go into that. That would mean a big investments. Further down the road. Big investments. Yeah. And we're not, we're not interested in that. We'd like to make no investments, if possible. In other words, we'd like to get the plan from GE on a rental basis, mm -hmm. effectively. Uh, we'll buy it, but uh, they'll finance it. So. Uh, you know, it'll be like what well, like these rental cars. If you get zero down, and you pay so much a month. Yeah. Could could you comment on uh, uh, nuclear power, both from the standpoint uh, of, um, yeah. uh, of of science and technology and yeah. regulation? Uh, what sort yeah. of future do you think it has? I'm a strong believer in nuclear power, as Joe knows, and always have been and still am. However, however, these questions have to be decided by economics. And uh, I cannot conceive of a nuclear power plant being constructed in the center of a city, let's say in Crystal City where I live. People won't stand for it. It has a bad name. I have no objection living next to a nuclear power station. I would be glad to do that. But uh, 
it, it, it won't happen. There's another important issue. Uh, because of uh, our limitations in metallurgy, uh, nuclear power uh, has an efficiency of only 30, 30 to 35 percent. Not that this is bad, because uh, the nuclear power is essentially is very, very cheap. The big investment is, of course, in the reactor itself. However, it means that you have to dispose of about 70, 65 to 70 percent of the heat into the environment, and that is expensive. That means you have to build cooling towers, fans, and other things, which take up a lot of space and uh, a lot of real estate. You can't, you, and you cannot co-generate as we're planning to do. Our whole uh, idea is based on not only high efficiency, but co-generation. Perhaps I should have mentioned that word explicitly. Co-generation means using the hot water that comes out of the power plant to provide heat to an urban development. And you can only do that uh, practically if you are co-located. You, you can, well, you can have pipes that run for miles, but it gets to be hairy. Easy to have pipes that run for yards. Yeah. About 10, 15 years ago, I, when I lived in Virginia, where you live now, I, I took a tour of, um, well, General Motors was, a, was displaying their hydrogen technology. I drove around a hydrogen car. Yeah. I drove around a hydrogen car. I saw a hydrogen power, personal power plant for somebody's home. Why? And I was told that hybrids were already <coughs> old technology. That's bridge technology. <coughs> we're going to hydrogen for everything. Why didn't that ever come about? It won't fly. It requires a completely new infrastructure. It's expensive to make. And it's not, it's just not competitive. It, it could work. No commercial future. But there are many people who consider the, the well, George Bush talked about the hydrogen economy. Yeah, he also talked about fuel cells for a while. Yeah. People talk about lots of things. <laughs> uh, even hybrid cars aren't, aren't all that uh, they're cracked up to be. The most efficient kind of car is a small car uh, burning uh, with a diesel engine. We don't have these cars in the United States. But if you make diesel fuel from gas, you can make it essentially sulfur-free, which means there would be no particulate emission, which is what people have objected to. And you can make extremely clean, much cleaner diesel than you can from crude oil. That's important. And you get efficient, you get the mileage just between 50 and 60 miles to the gallon. You don't want to can't be get, get much better than that. Now, hybrids do have one advantage. They have regenerative braking. Uh, that's nice if you do a lot of starting and stopping. So for delivery trucks, it does make a lot of sense. Maybe for buses, too. Mind a question on climate change. Climate change? What's that? <laughs> well, uh, climate is always changing. It, it is, and, and I'm not going to get into what I believe, but I run across a fellow named Richard Muller who I had identified as an ally, and I wanted to invite him to speak at a conference, which I'm helping to organize for investment managers. And then he came up with this new evidence he says that shows that. Global warming is real and almost entirely caused by human activity. And I was wondering if you could tell me what he's talking about. What new evidence is, is he finding that other people aren't? And is his, is, his work, is, is his work any good? In today's New York Times, you'll find an op-ed article written by Rich Muller, whom I know fairly well. He's a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley. And he writes that he used to be a skeptic, and now he's become a believer. 
Why? Because his data show a warming of X number of degrees in the last 150 years. There are many things wrong with his argument. I don't know where to start. In the first place, even if the data are correct, and they're not, believe me, the warming by itself doesn't tell you anything about the cause. You have to have fingerprints. And the fingerprints don't match the predictions of climate models. So you cannot assign any warming. You cannot, they don't know whether it's natural or man-made. You certainly cannot say it must be man-made. And then the data are wrong. His data are wrong. How do we know that? Well, he published one set of data last October. And then in March, he published a new set without explaining why he dropped the old set. I think he has a lot of explaining to do. He has to tell us what's wrong with the first set and maybe what might be wrong with the second set. And now we learn from something that Joe's just given me, uh, Jim just uh, ran off, uh, that there's a group of, that have published that show that the data themselves are phony. Uh, let me be more specific. During the 20th century, there were two periods of warming, one between 1910 and 1940, and that warming is genuine. It really did warm. But no one thinks that it was due to humans. There was very little CO2 being produced before World War II. But the warming is real and backed up by independent data from other sources. Then there's a reported warming, and this is what Rich Miller refers to, and all the other people, based on weather station data. They all use essentially the same raw data from weather stations. Uh, between 19, let's say, 1975 and 2000. And that warming may not be real at all. This has just been demonstrated in a new paper, which I haven't had a chance to read yet. If you hold it up, Jim, you'll see that it's very thick. And it'll take me a while to read it. But I will. I'll look at it, maybe on the plane, maybe when I get home. But so the, the data themselves are in doubt and in d direct disagreement with data from the atmosphere, from the ocean, and from other sources. So you have one set of data that says there's a warming, namely weather stations, which has just been shown to be uh, problematic, shall we say. And then you have many other kinds of data that don't show this warming. So who are you going to believe? Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay behind. If anybody wants to talk some more, I'll be glad to 